This doctor will explain to you step by step how to activate the third eye, proving through science that it is real and not a myth. He'll discuss how to move the cerebrospinal fluid and more. This video answers many questions, so buckle up and let's dive in. In your brain, there are fluid-filled ventricles, cavities. At the center of your brain, at the same location of your third eye, your brow center, there is a cavity called the third ventricle. The third ventricle is a midline space. Its boundaries are the pituitary gland in front, the pineal gland in back, and the thalamus and the hypothalamus on the sides. The space between these structures has been called the Crystal Palace by Taoists or the Cave of Brahma in some Hindu yogic traditions. This space is filled with fluid, the cerebrospinal fluid. What Dr. Mauro Zapatera just mentioned is an essential component of the human body known as CSF or cerebrospinal fluid. This remarkable fluid plays a crucial role in the functioning of our nervous system. Let's delve deeper into what cerebrospinal fluid is and its importance. The cerebrospinal fluid is a clear, colorless liquid that serves as a protective and nourishing agent for both the brain and the spinal cord. Residing within the brain's ventricles, which can be visualized as cavities shown here in this model, it plays a vital role in cushioning these critical areas. This fluid extends beyond just the internal aspects, it also envelops the brain's external surface, providing an additional layer of protection. Its journey doesn't end there. Cerebrospinal fluid continues its path down the spinal cord, flowing through the central canal and bathing the external surface of the spinal cord as well. This continuous flow ensures that the brain and spinal cord are consistently surrounded by this protective fluid. Interestingly, the human body contains about 150 milliliters of cerebrospinal fluid at any given time. This fluid isn't stagnant. It's continuously replenished, undergoing a complete turnover approximately three to four times daily. This equates to the body producing between 450 to 600 milliliters of cerebrospinal fluid each day. In simpler terms, Every day, our bodies generate about half a liter of this essential fluid, highlighting its significance in maintaining the health and functionality of our central nervous system. Now, let's return to Dr. Mauro Zapatera's presentation. As we continue, everything will start to come together, offering a clearer understanding of the third eye and the pineal gland and their intricate workings. So, what you see here is a sagittal or side view of an MRI of an adult human. The cerebrospinal fluid is colored in red. From this image, you can see how it bathes the entire outside of the brain, as well as the spaces inside and the entire outside of the spinal cord. Our central nervous system is floating in and being bathed by CSF. Interestingly, the spinal cord ends at about lumbar vertebra two, but the CSF goes all the way down into the sacrum. So it's important to know that the human central nervous system is remarkably suspended in a column of fluid. While the brain's actual mass ranges from 1400 to 1500 grams, its effective weight when immersed in cerebrospinal fluid is significantly reduced to around 25 to 50 grams. This illustrates that the entire central nervous system essentially floats within this fluid. There exists a central column of fluid aligned with their body's midline structure, providing this unique suspension and support. So where does this fluid come from? Well, that little black spot in the middle of that image is you. This was you as an embryo. You can see above that the amniotic fluid. Below that, you can see the yolk sac. And all around it, you can see the chorionic fluid. Look at how you are essentially developing surrounded by fluid, enclosed in fluid, and totally supported by fluid. You are organized and created with fluid. So where does the cerebrospinal fluid originate? Interestingly, it is derived from amniotic fluid through a process known as neurulation. Initially, in the embryonic stage, we start as a simple sheet of cells, as depicted in the image. Within this sheet, there is a specific area called the neural plate, which is a group of cells that undergo a process of invagination and neurulation. During this process, the neural plate folds inward, creating what are known as the neural grooves and neural folds. These folds eventually merge together. 
Surrounding the neural plate is the amniotic fluid, which plays a crucial role in this developmental phase. As the neural plate undergoes invagination, with the folds rising and eventually fusing, the central area transforms. This central area, which was once part of the external amniotic fluid, gradually becomes what we know as cerebrospinal fluid. Thus, cerebrospinal fluid actually originates from the amniotic fluid during our embryological development. It's a fascinating concept. Our brain and spinal cord are not just organized around fluid, but are also initially bathed in it, emphasizing the fluid's integral role from the very beginning of our development. Initially, your embryonic brain is a hollow, fluid-filled vesicle with cerebrospinal fluid on the inside of the tube and amniotic fluid on the outside of the tube. As you develop, the brain and spinal cord enlarge and differentiate, and cerebrospinal fluid continues to bathe the inside and outside of your entire central nervous system. So picture yourself as a tiny embryo. At the very beginning of your development, when you start to develop awareness, you're enveloped in this primal fluid within your mother's womb. This journey begins with the amniotic fluid, which gradually transitions into cerebrospinal fluid. Now, within you, this fluid plays a vital role, bathing your entire central nervous system. It encompasses both the internal and external areas of your brain and travels the entire length of your spinal cord, reaching down to your sacrum. Additionally, it flows within a central hollow canal located inside your spinal cord. This fluid's presence throughout your central nervous system is a testament to its fundamental importance right from the earliest stages of development. This understanding is very important, and everything will make sense in just a moment. This is a section through the head of a human embryo at eight weeks of development. Here you see the developing brain. It is a thin structure on top. I did not know what this cauliflower-like structure was seemingly floating in space. So I asked my colleague who told me, that was the choroid plexus. Well, the choroid plexus produces CSF. If the structure that makes the CSF was that large, then the CSF must have an important role. Essentially, our entire developing nervous system is bathed in cerebrospinal fluid that you see in blue. Martin Marzullo, director of the Heart Mind Institute, shares an insightful perspective on cerebrospinal fluid. He explains that while CSF isn't the direct cause of kundalini energy, it serves as a crucial vehicle for this energy as it travels through the body. This idea is further echoed by Dr. Randolph Stone, founder of Polarity Therapy, a holistic healthcare system. Dr. Stone has two notable quotes on this subject. He states that the soul swims in the cerebrospinal fluid, suggesting a profound connection between our spiritual essence and this fluid. Additionally, he observes that the cerebrospinal fluid appears to function as both a reservoir and a conduit for ultrasonic and light energy. Similarly, Dr. Sutherland has shared his insights, building upon the thoughts of Dr. Andrew Taylor Still, who had a unique version of the cerebrospinal fluid. Dr. Still saw the CSF as an intermediary in the flow of divine intelligence, channeling creation into embryological segments and infusing them with life form, function, and order. This perspective presents the CSF as more than just a physical substance. It's seen as a fluid imbued with intelligence and the capacity to shape our existence. Furthermore, the CSF is believed to be a sensitive receiver and transmitter of energy, vibrations, and information. This concept is similar to how flower remedies demonstrate water's ability to absorb, store, and transmit plant energies. In the same vein, Dr. Masaru Emoto's work showed that water could retain the energy of words. Thus, the cerebrospinal fluid may also have the capacity to absorb, store, and transmit the essence of the source, enabling us to experience and be consciously aware of our beingness. As I mentioned, the cerebrospinal fluid covers the entire outer surface of the brain. Let's take a look at where the cerebrospinal fluid is stored inside the brain and allow the structure to guide us. It is stored in what's called the ventricles of the brain. These are fluid-filled spaces. On the left, you see an image of the brain as if it's looking towards you. The blue is where the cerebrospinal fluid is held. 
on the right, you see an image of the brain on its side, as if it's looking to the left. Those are the ventricles as they appear inside the brain. Why does the why are the ventricles of the brain form the way they are? Why does the lateral ventricle make contact with the frontal lobe, the parietal lobe, the occipital lobe, and the temporal lobe of the brain? Why does the posterior horn of the lateral ventricle need to send a projection to contact the visual areas of the brain? Look at the third ventricle in the middle. This is a midline space. Why does the third ventricle have these two beaks? One that contacts the pituitary gland and the other one that contacts the pineal gland. It's like it has to make contact with these essential glands. So let's that allow the structure to guide us in understanding its function. So what do the cells look like that contact the CSF? Well, this is a scanning electron microscope image of the wall of the ventricle, the inside of the ventricle making contact with the CSF. What we see is that the walls of the ventricles that are contacting the CSF has these cilia or slender hair-like structure. The cilia can beat to actually create fluid movements. They are also like little antenna monitoring the fluid that have receptors on them to pick up information in the cerebrospinal fluid. So what's, re what receptors are found on these cells? There are photoreceptors that transmit light. There are chemoreceptors that transmit information from growth factors, ions, hormones, and mechanoreceptors that transmit information from flow, movement, and vibrations. So the CSF can transmit information from light, vibration, movement, and molecules. To provide a clearer understanding, let's discuss two significant molecules present in the cerebrospinal fluid, melatonin and DMT, both of which originate from tryptophan. It's believed that these are released by the pineal gland into the CSF. Melatonin plays a key role in regulating our sleep-wake cycles and circadian rhythms, while DMT, commonly found in various plants, is often used in shamanic rituals for its potent psychedelic effects, which can induce near-death and mystical experiences. The exact endogenous function of DMT in the human body is still being researched. Recent studies have indicated that DMT is produced in the pineal gland, choroid plexus, and brain. Intriguingly, its levels were observed to increase in the visual cortex of rats during cardiac arrest, leading to hypotheses about its potential role in near-death experiences. Imagine, then, the CSF as a conduit for the transmission of information. When a substance like melatonin or DMT is released into the CSF, it can quickly disperse the signal throughout various parts of the brain and spine simultaneously. This transmission occurs without the need for synapses, allowing for a total synchronization of information. This process can involve not just molecules like melatonin or DMT, but also growth factors crucial for brain development or health, or even frequencies and vibrations that contribute to our felt sense of connection to a greater source energy. It is my hypothesis that the biological occurrence of a kundalini awakening is the rising of sacred energy from the sacrum to the head through the cerebrospinal fluid. Let's take a look at this closer. The kundalini in yogic theory is a primal energy located at the, at the base of the spine. Some say residing in the sacrum like a sleeping serpent waiting to be awakened. From yogic practice, kundalini is awakened and physically moves up a central canal the shushumna to reach the third eye and subsequently the, the crown chakra for awakening to occur. Could the CSF be a transporter for this primal energy? Well, let's take a look at some of the anatomy. The sacrum is a large triangular bone at the base of the spine. The origin of the word comes from the Latin os sacrum, which means sacred bone. The end of the spinal cord is approximately at L2, and the CSF goes all the way down to about sacral level two or three. Interestingly, there's a fi filament called phylum terminale that goes all the way down from the bottom of the spinal cord to the coccyx. Remember, within the spinal cord, there's a canal filled with fluid that goes all the way up the spinal cord to the third ventricle. Some people claim there is a small fiber within the central canal of the spinal cord made of condensed CSF protein that goes to the pineal gland called Reisner's fiber. Swami Vivekananda, a revered yogi and teacher, offers profound insights into the yogic understanding of the human body. He explains, according to the yogis, there are two nerve currents in the spinal column, called Pingala and Ida, and a hollow canal called Sushumna, running through the spinal cord. 
At the lower end of the hollow canal is what the yogis call the lotus of the kundalini. They describe it as triangular in form, in which, in the symbolic language of the yogis, there is a power called the kundalini coiled up. When that kundalini awakens, it tries to force a passage through this hollow canal, and as it rises step by step, as it were, layer after layer of the mind becomes open, and all the different visions and wonderful powers come to the yogi. When it reaches the brain, the yogi is perfectly detached from the body and mind, and the soul finds itself free. The left is the ida, the right pingala. And that hollow canal which runs through the center of the spinal cord is the sushumna, where the spinal cord ends. In some of the lumbar vertebrae, a fine fiber issues downward, and the canal runs up, even within that fiber, only much finer. The canal is closed at the lower end, which is situated near what is called the sacral plexus. Vivekananda mentions the ida, tingala, and shishumna which are considered the three main nadis in yodic tradition. The term nadi originates from Tamil, meaning nerve, blood vessel, or pulse, and from Sanskrit, meaning channel, stream, or flow. In this context, ida is positioned to the left of the spine, pingala to the right, and the shishumna runs along the center of the spinal cord. In some illustrations, ida and pingala are depicted as intertwining around the shishumna in a helical pattern intersecting at points that correspond to the chakras in the body. This intricate system highlights a deep connection between our physical and subtle energy bodies as understood in yogic philosophy. To me, the ida and the pingala represent the pineal and the pituitary glands, the shishumna coming up from the center of the spine in the tube full of cerebrospinal fluid, all meeting at the third ventricle, the fluid-filled radiant space in the middle of our head, the crystal palace, the cave of Brahma. It is the space where the marriage of the yin and the yang energies of the pineal gland and the pituitary gland come to form a perfect harmony. It is my belief that this is the place for the birth of the I am in physical form, where through dispersion of the energy within the fluid, our entire brain is simultaneously bathed with the differentiated energy from the source, providing the synchronous, unified experience and awareness of our true essence. But this leads us to an important question. How does one actually move the CSF? What causes CSF to move in the first place? Many people have asked me what causes the cerebrospinal fluid to move. My theories, in addition to the ones that we're gonna go on, are any sort of parasympathetic activity, such as rest, meditation, craniosacral therapy, massage, movement, such as dance, exercise, yoga, vibrations, such as sound and light, visualized intention and love. Given the potential that CSF is activated by light and sound. One of my business partners and I created the Metatronics Vibrational Medicine Light and Sound Machine depicted here. Essentially, Meta is beyond, Tron is subatomic particle, so it's beyond the subatomic particle, beyond form. A machine that works on the energetic levels and vibrational levels prior to form. So what causes the CSF to move from a, what has been shown in the research? Sleep has been shown to move the cerebrospinal fluid through the brain tissue. Well, the research shows that the heartbeat has been shown to move the cerebrospinal fluid. However, one of the major drivers of CSF movement is our breath. This is an MRI image of the brain. And in image D there, you see that is the image of what is enlarged in, in image B. That is an enlarged view of the third ventricle. Here is a series of pictures depicting the CSF flow, which is the bright spot that you see coming into the third ventricle during forced inspiration. This depicts one inspiration lasting 2.5 seconds. So it'd be something like this. Inspiration actually drives the CSF into the third ventricle, the cave of Brahman, the fluid-filled space in the center of the brain. This is a diagram of the CSF flow during forced breathing at each spinal level. The bars above the line indicate movement towards the head, and the bars below the line indicate movement towards the sacrum. The IN in red is forced inspiration, and the EX in blue is expiration. The red bars show that forced inspiration leads to an upward flow of CSF 
at all spinal levels that were tested. The blue bars show that there's that forced expiration leads to a downward flow only in the mid and lower spinal cord region. The amount of research linking breath work with the brain activity is truly astonishing. Recent findings have revealed that our breathing can actively influence the flow of cerebrospinal fluid. Consider the various breathwork practices, like holotropic breathwork, the Wim Hof method, pranayama, or even just deep breathing exercises aimed at relaxation. Now, envision how each breath you take could be actively circulating the CSF within your spine and brain. This concept opens up exciting possibilities, such as the idea of cosmic consciousness spreading throughout your being, synchronized with the movement of this vital cerebrospinal fluid. Our central nervous system is in an entire column of fluid. This fluid may be an intermediary between the infinite and the finite, a condensation of a less condensed form of energy, a breathing. By breathing, we can create a rhythm in the fluid, an undulating process with oscillations. This has the ability to bring vibrations and energy frequency to the fluid, which can transmit the rhythms of life and the rhythms of the infinite. Evolutionarily, the CSF system evolved as a way to receive signals and transmit information. Our ancestral CSF is seawater. So connect to the fluid that surrounded you as an embryo, to the fluid that is bathing the inside and outside of your entire central nervous system right now, to all the fluid in all the oceans that have ever been present in history. The fluid is bathing the inside and outside of your brain and spine. Imagine it being a perfect vehicle to transmit information to the brain, whether that is melatonin to help us sleep or DMT, or as a fluid conductor of source energy to our physical bodies, to transmit the experience of I am, our beingness, as well as a vehicle of cosmic consciousness, that awareness of the universal mind and one's unity with it. In conclusion, we owe a profound depth of gratitude to Dr. Mauro Zapatera for his illuminating discoveries and contributions in the field of cerebrospinal fluid research. His insights have not only enlightened us, but also opened up new vistas of understanding about this vital fluid. The journey of CSF from its embryonic origins to its multifaceted roles in adulthood underscores its profound significance in our bodily functions and perhaps even in our spiritual experiences. As a medium that nurtures and protects our central nervous system and potentially serves as a conduit for higher energies and consciousness, CSF bridges the gap between the tangible and intangible aspects of our existence. It's clear that the CSF is much more than just a protective fluid. It's a vital component of our being, integral to both our physical health and spiritual well-being. The exploration of its roles and functions, greatly aided by Dr. Zapatera's work, opens up new frontiers in understanding the human body and consciousness. In appreciating Dr. Zapatera's work, we recognize the importance of ongoing research and inquiry into this fascinating aspect of human physiology. How do we harness and understand the full potential of this incredible fluid? This is the challenge and opportunity that lies ahead for us in the realms of medicine, science, and spirituality. Thank you, Dr. Zapatera, for enlightening us and helping us learn something new. Your work has truly enhanced our appreciation of the cerebrospinal fluid's integral role in our journey from the finite to the infinite. Thank you for joining me on this exploration of the cerebrospinal fluid and its critical place in our lives.